competing and rival concepts of rehabilitation, how they fit together and where they don't fit, and where I think we perhaps should be going. Can you all hear me all right? Yes, good. Um, it sounds a bit strange, but it, it's okay, is it? Right? Um, I've called it helping people to stop offending evidence, methods, and context. That gives you an idea. What I'll be aiming to talk about, if I can fit all this in, is first of all, just to remind you of the kind of well-established current thinking about what works that's become a kind of orthodoxy in work with offenders. Then what goes wrong when we try to apply this? Because in England and Wales particularly, we've had a big effort at applying this material and we've had it go wrong in a number of ways and we're beginning to understand why and what did go wrong. I want to talk about some of the other theories that people are beginning to put forward to try and fill gaps in what works, to try and make it more humane and more responsive. And particularly, I want to mention the Good Lives model. I want to mention some experiences that we've had with restorative justice within the criminal justice system. And I want to mention the impact of desistance theory on the way we work with offenders. Part of that impact is to make us think again about the importance of individual relationships in the process of people learning to think better about themselves. And this leads me on to consideration of individual skills used by practitioners. Hello, you can sit further forward if you want, unless you want to hide. <laughs> um, and the importance of individual supervision and support and the way this has been conceptualized as what are called core correctional practices. This is a Canadian phrase, but um, we find it quite useful in research. And in particular, I want to talk about some of the recent work on the impact of effective skills in individual supervision. Finally, if there's time, I want to say a little bit about social contexts of two kinds. First of all, there's the organizations which organize the delivery of rehabilitation. Do they actually facilitate it and make it better, or do they not? Do they get in the way? Secondly, there is the wider social context what kind of society are we trying to rehabilitate offenders into? Sometimes we ask the question, desistance to what? Or resettlement to where? The, the kind of society that we're trying to fit the offenders back into has some influence on how effectively we can do that. And the more commitment there is to social welfare generally, the easier it will be to find support for offender rehabilitation. And then hopefully at the end we have time for some questions. A little bit of autobiography now. When I joined the probation service in England, and that is now 46 years ago as I joined the probation service in England. We all believed that we were doing some good and that we were helping offenders to offend less. We could not demonstrate this. We had very little evidence in our support. And in the middle of the 1970s, we suddenly found that the evidence that most criminologists were accepting was actually the doctrine that nothing works. And I've got two examples of it here. First of all, as Robert Martinson from his famous article in 1974, with few and isolated exceptions, 
the rehabilitative efforts that have been reported so far have had no appreciable effects on recidivism. Of course, he was exaggerating a bit. He was oversimplifying the research that he had been part of. Nevertheless, his conclusions found a lot of support among people who were, in the 1970s, wanting to reduce spending on social welfare and social programs of all kinds. So reducing spending on offender rehabilitation fitted into that. And these ideas went round the world. The second piece of text there, longer, more verbose, but um, what's... effect. He, he went on to say, we spent a lot of money on these. The dilemma is that a considerable investment has been made. Should we simply abandon them? Or will this challenge evoke a response by the invention of new approaches and new methods? And what happened, of course, was the invention of new, new approaches and new methods. Hello. Mostly not in Britain. Those conclusions. What we got instead was work mainly by psychologists, much of it in Canada, though it also went on in other countries, Australia and Germany, for example, and some of it in Scotland. In 1990, we had the publication of the big meta-analysis by Don Andrews and Jim Bonta and their colleagues in Canada, the if, Does Correctional Treatment Work? That was the article published in the journal Criminology. And much of this actually comes already from that article as far back as 1990. For example, First of all, I need to mention this word program. Properly speaking, program in English refers to any structured and replicable way of working <coughs> with people that are under your supervision or that you are training. It doesn't have to mean a group program. There are individual programs. There are programs with rolling entry where people join them at different times. There are some quite um, fluid programs. It's only, I think, in Britain that we behaved as if program always meant cognitive behavioral group offending behavior program. And it, it doesn't have to mean that, and it didn't to the Canadians who put forward these arguments in the first place. What did they tell us? Well, you're familiar with the idea of targeting risk, that services should be delivered not to the lowest risk people where they make no difference, but to higher risk people where they will make no, more difference. Focusing on criminogenic need, in other words, those aspects of people's lives and personalities that actually make them more likely to offend, as opposed to other things which make no difference. Structured, they have a plan and a purpose and a, a progressive movement through the program. They use direction, in other words, they are directive. A lot of social workers in the 1960s and 1970s, when I first got involved in social work, were actually trained to be non-directive, and this was less effective than um, explaining to people what you wanted them to do because it was very puzzling when people were not told what social workers wanted them to do. Um, a friend of mine was trained by a psychologist in the home office um, and one day she asked the group what time it is, what time is it? And they asked her what time do you feel it is? Right? That's a, an exaggeration of 
um, non-directive approaches. Looking at the methods used with offenders, there was a tendency for programs which used cognitive behavioral methods designed to change people's thinking and as a result change some of what they felt and change how they behaved tended to have better results than programs which used other methods somewhat better not always dramatically better but this has been a consistent result in research since then that these methods have advantages according to the Canadians Programs located in the community tend to have better results. That wasn't always our experience in Britain, and I'll come on to why that, that is. High integrity programs should be delivered as they are planned and as they are designed. And some of the things we've learnt since then that were not in the original meta-analysis, committed management is one, they need to be delivered in agencies which are strongly committed to delivering them and resource them adequately. Appropriately trained staff, and I'll say a bit more later about what sort of training. Adequate resources. It's very common that we find programs are piloted in a well-resourced fashion, and then when they are rolled out and delivered by larger, uh, in, in more and more places, we find that they are under-resourced. Integral evaluation, one of the surprising findings of several of the early meta-analyses was that if your program has a researcher attached and is being evaluated, it's likely to be better. It's likely to be better delivered, it's likely to have better results. That's actually a very strong argument for attaching researchers to, to a large range of service delivery because it, um, it works in a number of different settings. And you know the kind of summary of all this, the abbreviation RNR, risk, need, responsivity. What is responsivity? Well, they always had more to say about risk and need, to be honest. Responsivity is much less clearly explained, but it refers to using methods which are appropriate to the learning styles of the people you're using them with. And a lot of the work that we've done since, trying to unpack the response of offenders to different kinds of approaches, is actually unpacking this concept of responsivity, which was not well explained, I think, in the early research. <coughs> Friedrich Lösel in Germany did a large meta-analysis a few years ago of research on programs based on these principles from around the world, and he concluded that typically they are capable of reducing offending by 10 percentage points or more. At best, you can be looking at 15 or 20, but most of the time we don't see such high figures and we need to be thinking about why not. And a lot of the problem lies in implementation, how programs are delivered. I can give you some examples of this. These are some of the things that we have found tend to reduce the quality and integrity of delivery. Some of them will be obvious to you. Um, by the way, how many probation staff are we? How many of you are probation officers, probation staff, probation service staff? None of you. About three are prepared to admit this. Four. How many of you work in prisons? Right. right. Okay. That's useful to know. Um, what happened in England and Wales was that these new ideas were introduced in the mid-1990s, 
And then in 1999, the government put a lot of money into their implementation, but this money was only available for three years. And so what we saw, in effect, was an attempt to transform probation services into services that would work in a completely new way within three years. And this proved, you won't be surprised to hear, this proved to be impossible to do. Um, it was not possible to implement the programs correctly. It wasn't possible to train the people to deliver them in that time. One of the things that particularly went wrong was that probation services in Britain had no proper system of risk assessment in place at that time. And so they were not very good at deciding who should do these programs and who should do something else, with the result that we now estimate, or we now know, that half the people who did these programs were the wrong people. And this greatly reduced the effectiveness. It also led to... <coughs> it led to very large numbers of people dropping out of the programs, sometimes more than half the people who started them. <coughs> the emphasis on putting lots of people into programs led to a neglect of individual support for those people. They were used to having probation officers supervise them individually. Suddenly they found themselves in programs. Sometimes <coughs> they no longer saw their probation officers. And this also increased the attrition because they had other problems in their lives and they would drop out of programs to deal with other problems like problems with welfare benefits, problems with money, problems with losing their homes, family problems. And because they had nobody helping them with those things, this led to poor attendance at the programs. The next item <coughs> is why I asked how many people here were probation officers, because I wonder if you recognize yourselves in this at all. I wonder if it's the same here as it is in Britain. The tradition, the culture of probation services in Britain is derived from the, the earliest stages of probation history when individual probation officers were appointed for individual magistrates' courts. And so they were individual practitioners. And that has its good side because it means people take personal responsibility for the outcomes of their work, which is good. It also has a more difficult side. It makes them difficult to organize, it makes them difficult to manage. Um, and so it takes time to, to get them all working in a particular way because you need to convince each of them individually. They need a lot of information. They need a lot of training. In the mid-90s, I evaluated a program which actually worked very well. One of the reasons it worked well is because the probation service that ran it took more than two years introducing it. And the chief officer went around every office and every team and discussed it with them and explained it to them and said, if you don't want this, it won't happen. And, um, and so they were all on board. Right? When they then tried to make the whole probation service across the whole country transform its way of working within a very short time, it, um, it didn't work because uh, it was very difficult for probation culture to adapt to this. A very interesting thing in Britain, or in England and Wales, is that we've actually had better implementation of programs in the prisons than we have in the community. And the result is that the usual finding on effectiveness, which is that things will work better in the community, is actually reversed in Britain. There are also some concerns that people had about the theories behind the programs. 
and I've listed some of those here. First of all, psychological reductionism. What do I mean? Some people argued that risk assessment in particular took social problems like poverty and homelessness and turned them into individual risk factors as if they could be dealt with by working with individual people rather than making social policy changes, for example, which is the only way to address problems of that kind. The reduction of social problems to a psychological issue, psychological reductionism. There was also a, a concern that risk assessment focused very much on negative things, focused very much on deficits, particularly on what they called at that time cognitive deficits, and that this meant its impact was largely negative. It became a kind of list of problems. Didn't include strengths, didn't include <coughs> positive goals, excuse me, the emphasis was on what should be avoided or what should be changed rather than what could be achieved. <coughs> now there is actually some misunderstanding here because I say apparent negative focus. In practice, successful work with RNR as in any other branch of human services, really, has to be done in a spirit of optimism. It has to be done with positive goals. It has to be done looking forward to the future um, with some optimism. And the problem is that this perhaps hasn't been written about enough. It was taken for granted by the people who developed RNR and who spread it around the world. But, um, but they didn't emphasize it sufficiently. And so <coughs> excuse me, you get this impression that the focus is on deficits. Where I think there is more justification is in the criticism that risk assessment is essentially backward looking. It's looking at a lot of things that have gone wrong in the past and it doesn't focus on where things might go in the future. It doesn't focus on positives. It doesn't focus on um, what are often called approach goals as opposed to avoidance goals. It tells you what's wrong. It doesn't tell you what you should do instead to make it right. And And some recent developments have focused very strongly on that. But before I move on to some alternative formulations, I need to redress the balance a bit. It's still the case that programs and ways of working based on RNR principles have more empirical support than anything else so far. And they have by far more empirical support even in England and Wales. The problem in England and Wales was timing, trying to do too much too quickly. When we look at the results over a longer period of time, when you look at them over six years rather than over three years, this is what you start to get. Um, look at this figure here. People who actually completed the programs, their offending was reduced 25% less than it had been before. The people who did short prison sentences, their offending hardly reduced at all. Why are these two figures so different? It's because this figure includes all the people who dropped out, whereas this is just the completers. Um, one implication of that is it would be useful to get more people to complete, obviously. Completion rates did improve 
until until the latest big changes in probation in Britain, the privatization of large parts of the service that's created, uh, well, a lot of chaos at the moment. And um, I can tell you more about that later if you like. <coughs> but until that happened, there was an improvement in attendance. But still, a lot of people didn't complete. However, That's what was in the end achieved by RNR in Britain. Better results for some people, but a lot of people were not involved in it. A lot of people never got near group programs anyway. They simply continued to receive individual supervision. Where we need to do more work and to fill gaps in the knowledge base, even for RNR, Well, these are five of the areas that I think we need to be looking at. One is responsivity. I've said a bit about that. Um, We do not know enough about how to adapt these methods to the needs of particular minority groups within the criminal justice system. That includes particularly women, where the motivation for offending and the route to becoming an offender appears very often to be quite different from those of men. And a lot of these programs were originally based on research on men. Some things fit, other things don't fit at all for different minority groups. There are issues about different ethnic groups. There are issues about different nationalities sometimes. Um, People with different religious commitments may respond to different approaches. Responsivity needs needs more work. Motivation. People dropping out of programs suggests a problem with motivation. There has been a need, and still is a need, to supplement the methods used by practitioners in these programs with techniques like motivational interviewing and with ways of encouraging people to see the future more positively. So positive goals. <coughs> positive aims as opposed to simply negatives, deficits to be corrected. Social support. We we forgot that as well as doing programs, we needed to be doing social work with offenders who had social problems. And (coughs) that has had to come back. How do we help people to build a self-concept which is pro-social, a new identity as a non-offending person, an identity as a good person with standing in the community and a person worthy of respect. This is where resistance theory particularly has produced some good ideas. First of all, you will have heard, I think, of the good lives model developed originally for use with sex offenders by Tony Ward. Um, Quite controversial in some ways. One of my Canadian contacts is Paul Gendreau, who was um, involved in the early work with Andrews and Bonta and others. And Paul Gendreau gets quite cross when you mention Tony Ward, um, because he thinks that Ward made an unjustified attack on on the psychology of working with offenders. More realistically, I think we could say that um, the good lives model was a response to some of the gaps in the way RNR had been presented. Particularly, Tony Ward emphasized that you couldn't work with sex offenders simply on the basis that they should give up everything that their lives had been organized around for many years, um, there had to be an idea of a more worthwhile life that they could achieve. And so positive goals, approach goals as opposed to avoidance goals, an emphasis on strengths. Why is assessment all about negatives? Assessment should include 
what people are good at, what strengths they have, what they're capable of. Motivation, again. Motivation for Tony Ward is looking to the future, looking at what you want to achieve, and looking at how you're going to get there. When he first started writing about this approach, he presented it very much as an alternative to RNR. I remember speaking at conferences with him when he said, this is what we should be doing instead. But now I think it's more often seen as, as something that fits in with RNR and fills some of the gaps. It's seen as complementary. And certainly it's compatible. I think by absorbing some of these lessons into RNR methods, we can actually increase the effectiveness. The other thing to remember about the good lives model is really there is very little convincing research so far demonstrating that it has positive impacts. That doesn't necessarily mean that it doesn't have. It probably means that research to test some of these theories is actually very difficult to design. But there is very little research supporting it so far. If you look at the kind of psychological origins of these approaches, then RNR is based very much on social learning theory, which is about how people learn, how people acquire behavior, how people acquire different ways of thinking. Um, the good lives model, you could say, adds a focus on why. Um, what are people trying to achieve? Why will they be doing certain things? And why would they change? Good Lives model presents itself as much more forward-looking than the risk management-based models. Another forward-looking approach, which has been tried with some success recently, is restorative justice, which aims to resolve issues around the offence and allow people to move on. And so it's about restoring people's normal stake and membership in the community. The, the best recent study that I can find of the, the large-scale use of restorative justice within the criminal justice system, linked to sentences and linked to criminal justice decision-making, um, is actually the recent study done for the Ministry of Justice by Sheffield University, by Joanna Shackland, Gwen Robinson, Angela Sorsby, and you can find all about it in this book. One of the remarkable things about this study, well, one remarkable thing, is that it actually found a beneficial effect on offending, which I'll talk about in a minute. Another remarkable thing was that it led very quickly to changes in the law, that in some circumstances the courts are now required to give people the option of a restorative um, justice experience. In the research that they did in Sheffield, they found that there were positive effects if there had been what's called a conference in restorative justice, um, which is an actual meeting with the victim and probably people supporting the victim as well. There's very little positive effect if there isn't a meeting, but when there is a meeting, then there appears to be some very useful learning. What they found was a reduction in the frequency of offending there was not a reduction in the proportion of people who re-offended compared to a control group of similar offenders who didn't have conferences. Um, but those people who did go on to offend offended less frequently than similar people who did, didn't have the restorative experience. They also offended less seriously, actually, which is useful. There were no criminogenic effects. In other words, they didn't find people being made worse by these experiences. Um, you may think that's not surprising, but actually criminogenic effects are quite common in the history of research on work with offenders. 
and there are some um, some studies which do show people being made worse. Restorative justice doesn't appear to make people worse. For offenders, there is some very positive learning. For example, offenders who said it made them think about the harm they'd done, perhaps for the first time, actually did then go on to offend less, which is um, exactly what they were trying to achieve, of course. But here is the implementation point. I talked about the implementation problems with RNR and programs in England and Wales. These researchers point to some similar problems around restorative justice. It needs to be properly prepared. It takes time to set it up properly. It needs properly trained people. It needs to be properly resourced and so on. Um, if there is only a limited resource to do it with, much better to do a small-scale pilot, do it properly, than try to spread it thin over, um, over too many areas and too many organizations. What about all the new writing around desistance from offending, where um, my friend Fergus McNeil is very much involved, and Glenn Robinson, and... Shad Maruna. Um, what implications does this have for practice? I know that when this writing first became popular in England and Wales, a lot of practitioners welcomed it because they thought it justified and supported the work that they were already doing. They thought that what works meant they all had to change, whereas desistance meant they could carry on doing what they were doing before. And um, some people I know in the Ministry of Justice actually believe that the adoption of desistance theory has led to a reduction in referral to programs, which is interesting. Um, I think that kind of reaction is based on quite a big misunderstanding of what desistance theory is telling us. And... Um, some of the things it's telling us are here. For example, it's not something that happens all at once. It's a process that goes on over a long period of time. And there are relapses. Um, one of my colleagues describes it as a zigzag approach. You, you take some steps forward, you take some steps back, and so on. Um, people don't suddenly become desisting offenders if they've been habitual offenders. They approach it, they move away from it, they get some way and then slip back. Social and individual capital, well social capital is about social opportunities, social resources. Have you got a job? Have you got a house? Have you got a um, partner? Have you got friends? Have you got social supports? Um, individual capital, can you read and write? Um, have you got skills that you would be able to offer? To, to an employer? Have you got skills in anything other than the, the, the criminal things you've been doing? And um, we also now think in terms of primary and secondary desistance in the same way that years ago we used to think about primary and secondary deviance. Um, primary desistance is when you, when you pause a bit, when you start to desist. Secondary desistance is when you have a non-offending identity established and you think of yourself differently. What facilitates the achievement of secondary des desistance? It seems to be very largely other people. It's um, uh, you acquire attachments to people who might be adversely affected by your offending and you begin to think differently about your offending as a result. Very often, these are partners. Very often, they are children. What we need to remember is this isn't just a process of individual adjustment. It's a process of social adjustment it requires access to assistance. It requires access to resources. It's not something people can typically sustain on their own. 
and it requires the motivation to make use of the help that is offered. Is it a matter of individual thinking or is it a matter of social causation? Are people in trouble because society has treated them wrongly or are they in trouble because they have the wrong thoughts? This first quotation is from a very large study of people leaving prison in Canada and it shows that both these things are true People start offending, typically because of the social circumstances that they're in. They carry on offending because they have acquired the habit of thinking like offenders. And, um, and they would have, to, would have to lose that if they are to take advantage of the opportunities that do become available. When I was involved in research on resettlement of prisoners, what we found in summary was that people needed help with the practical problems of their lives that they encountered on leaving prison, and they also needed help with the way they were thinking. One of the biggest influences on the way we now look at the desistance process has been the work of Shad Maruna, who writes about desistance narratives. Um, narratives being the stories that we tell ourselves and other people about who we are, about what kind of people we are. He worked with people who were stopping offending and people who were continuing to offend, looking at the differences between the kind of narratives, the kind of personal stories that they told. And people who were stopping believed that they were in control, they believed that they could take charge, they believed that they could make their lives different, and they wanted to. People who were still offending saw themselves as victims of circumstances. They didn't think they could make a difference. They would tell him things like, I'm always going to be in trouble, nothing ever works out for me, everything I do goes wrong. So again here, we're looking at forward thinking, we're looking at the kind of goals that people have, the kinds of beliefs they have about their ability to achieve them, and um, these differences in thinking are very important in the construction of a non-offending identity, the process of secondary desistance. <coughs> Moving quickly on, one of the things that convinces some offenders that they can develop a pro-social identity is the opinions about them that other people have and that other people demonstrate. Relationships become important. This is why a lot of practitioners really like this kind of work because it puts relationships right at the core of effective work with offenders. Of course, these relationships aren't necessarily with criminal justice personnel. They're actually more likely to be with partners, with friends, and so on. But sometimes criminal justice personnel, probation officers, prison officers, play a critical role in providing the kind of relationship that allows people to take a more positive view of themselves and allows people to develop more pro-social thinking. These relationships work better if they are managed with appropriate skill, what in the R&R literature are called core correctional practices, CCPs. For example, listening, understanding, helping, challenging thinking, being reliable and consistent. I've been able recently to do some research on whether people use these skills in the supervision of offenders and how much they use them. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about this because I'll overrun time, but um, 
Some of you may have heard of the Jersey Supervision Skills Study, which is a study in which we videotaped a whole lot of interviews with, between probation officers and the people they were supervising. We looked at what skills the officers were using. We compared the outcomes for the officers who used a lot of skills with the outcomes for officers who didn't. And you can read the full results in that reference there. But um, the skills we looked at were these. This is more or less the same kind of list of core correctional practices that some of the Canadian researchers have used. We changed it a bit for reasons I won't go into now. But um, you'll see some of these are in black, some of them are in red. The ones in red are what we call structuring skills. The ones in black are what we call relationship skills or responsive skills. Um, most social workers have quite good relationship skills. They very often don't have good structuring skills because they don't take charge and try to produce change enough. Never mind the detail, never mind the 63 items in nine clusters. Um, what we found is officers do differ a lot in the levels of skills they typically use in an interview. Some of them are much more skillful than others. For a lot of them, this is quite consistent or across a whole range of different kinds of interviews. Skillful officers will show a lot of skill and less skillful officers won't. The differences were mainly in the structuring skills, the kind of change-promoting skills like the motivational interviewing and pro-social modeling and teaching problem solving. And the relationship scores are mostly quite good. Um, we also did a reconviction study. If you want the detail of what skills people were using and the, the amount of differences, um, you can find these in the original article. The reconviction figures are quite simple, and I've got them here. No longer 95 interviews, because some of them involve the same person being interviewed more than once. If you drop all those out so everybody's counted only once, you get down to 75. And we followed them up for two years. Um, did they reconvict or not? The key figures are these. Reconviction rate for people supervised by staff using fewer skills was 58%. The reconviction rate for people who received more skilled supervision was less than half that, 26%. Um, and, and this is a very interesting result. It's the kind of result that um, you don't normally get. And so we spent a lot of time checking that it was real. And um, it, it does appear to be real. It's also statistically significant, which is um, difficult to achieve with such small numbers, but it is there. And this suggests to, well, that those of us who are involved in this research that if you want a cost-effective way of improving the effectiveness of criminal justice services, then one very promising avenue to go down is skills training for staff. It's also very likely to be effective because... In this study, the staff who did not consistently show high levels of skill, they did do that sometimes in most cases. They did it sometimes. So we're not talking about things they were incapable of doing. We're talking about things that they simply need to do more often and find more opportunities to do. So training should, for at least some of them, increase their levels of skill. There's an experiment done by Jim Bonta in Canada which has done exactly that. It has trained staff to work in a more skillful way and their work has improved and they have achieved lower reconviction rates as a result. And um, we did look at um, were the 
higher skilled staff getting better results because they were dealing with less risky offenders. And no, that's not the case. In fact, the reverse, the reverse is the case. They're dealing with slightly more risky offenders. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I know you all like statistics, but I haven't got time to go through this in detail. I, I know you'll be disappointed by this. Um, and, um, but you can read about them in the paper in the, the journal. Um, what this is about is which skills were strongly correlated with success at the one-year stage, at the two-year stage. Um, but sadly, I will have to leave out the detail of this on this occasion, though I will come back to it if people want to ask about it. Um, one of the unusual things about this project is... Um, I spent about four years uh, nagging the probation officers in this study to remember to video record their interviews and send me the recordings. And um, I would go back there about every six months and they would say, is this study still going on? And I would say, yes, it is, because you haven't yet sent me enough recordings to complete it. And uh, I hoped, in the, I hoped to get 100, but I had to settle for 95 in the end. Um, and then, you know, I had all the data, I had all the recordings. I thought the officers would be very relieved that they didn't have to do this anymore. But what happened instead was they telephoned me and said, can you come over to Jersey to train us to use your research instrument and the manual um, so that we can do this ourselves. Because what we've been doing was we've been using a, a complicated checklist to analyze and score the interviews. And, um, and the officers wanted to learn to do this themselves. Um, and I, I went over and trained them to do it, which was very, very easy. And they were very good at it. And now what they do is... They videotape a certain number of interviews every three months, and then they go through them with a colleague or with a senior officer, and they score them. They assess them using the checklist. They discuss the differences in the scoring. Um, interestingly, they don't add up totals as I needed to do for research. They, um, they simply look at what skills were used, what skills weren't used. Um, and. I've sat in on some of these discussions, and they are very, very interesting. Um, and we're looking at the moment at, um, at whether this does actually change the level of skill that people use. But um, I thought it was very interesting that the research, um, well, that the officers got the point of the research to the extent of wanting to do it themselves and actually making it as a result, much more useful because it's much more likely to change behavior through them doing it than through you know, people reading an article in a journal or whatever. Um, I understand some other countries are also trying this. I met somebody from Finland the other day who um, is introducing this over there, and I think some of this happening in France as well. Um, so what do we learn from all this? Um, this really is the end. Um, Evidence-based practice does work. It works if practitioners understand it. And that was the problem in England and Wales. Many of them never did. And if they believe that it will help them do their work better. In other words, if they can own it as part of their professional practice. Um, otherwise, Certainly with probation staff, it's very hard to persuade people to do anything different at all because um, unless they think it contributes to what they believe their work is about, then they kind of won't adopt it. Um, or even worse, they'll pretend to adopt it but not really do it. Prison staff, it may be rather different. I was talking a couple of weeks ago to one of the Ministry of Justice psychologists about why the implementation of programs has proceeded with more integrity 
in the prisons than, than in the community. And um, she said it was because people who worked in prisons were used to doing what they were told. And so they, they'd actually followed the instructions they were given, whereas probation staff were more used to kind of negotiating about what they were told, and so they didn't um, precisely follow. And uh, um, I, that might be true. I don't know. It's something I will try and find out about. I promised to say a bit about context as well. There isn't time to, send, to, to say a great deal about context, but one part of it is about the organizations. If criminal justice agencies value, support, and train, and listen to their staff, then evidence-based practice is likely to catch on better and quicker. Um, when I was evaluating programs in the 1990s, a colleague of mine, Maurice Vanstone, used to argue that um, what he found in the organizations that were doing it well was what he called a culture of curiosity. Staff who wanted to know what would happen if they did something different and who were prepared to make the effort and take the risk of finding out. And there is a risk in research. There's a risk in evaluative research that you may find out that the things you most want to do are not doing any good at all or even doing harm. And we won't make much progress unless staff are routinely prepared to take that kind of risk. And so this culture of curiosity needs developing. Finally, something which so far there has not been enough research on, but I hope there will be more because it's definitely needed. What kinds of society promote the effective rehabilitation of offenders? Some of this, I think, is obvious. Um, societies which are committed to the welfare of the population, that um, believe in helping people to have good health and jobs and reasonable incomes and so on, um, are better places to try and rehabilitate offenders. You can't give offenders lots of rights which the ordinary non-offending population don't have, but rehabilitation doesn't really require that. It simply requires you to lift offenders <coughs> up to the same level that everybody else has access to anyway. In Norway, they have something called the return guarantee for ex-prisoners, which is actually about the civil rights of ex-prisoners. Um, that they should have the same opportunities of accessing education, training, work, housing, and so on, as everybody else. The, um, some people in Britain who've been doing research on the impact of inequality in society and the impact of increasing inequality find, for example, that you tend to have more punitive criminal justice systems and higher rates of imprisonment in societies that are very unequal. Um, it's not quite clear why. It may be because the more unequal a society is, the more people believe that what happens to you is the result of your own individual virtue or your own individual wickedness and so they're perhaps more punitive and less inclined to see the influence of environment and resources on the way people behave. That's possible. Um, I, I've certainly seen society in Britain become more unequal and more dominated by neoliberal politics over the past couple of decades. And um, that's coincided with more than doubling the prison population. When I was a probation officer, the prison population in England and Wales was less than half what it is now, although the crime rate was actually higher. But since then, the system has become more and more punitive. And I believe that this is connected to wider social and political developments that have made it a less rehabilitative society and this has made things more difficult for workers in criminal justice who are trying to rehabilitate it, trying to rehabilitate. Um, 
But this is really getting me into the area of speculation. Um, I know this is being recorded, so there's a limit to how much I want to speculate about British politics. But um, um, the point of this is that rehabilitation, we now know, is possible. We also know know, that it's quite difficult. We know some things about how to do it. We know some things about why we don't do that all the time. We're beginning to know some things about how to do it more of the time. Um, And quite clearly, we can become more effective if we learn and disseminate the lessons from what's been done so far. Otherwise, we simply reinvent the same errors in one place after another. And that's, that's all. Um, I was asked to leave some time for questions. I think I've succeeded in doing that just about. So does anybody want to ask any questions? You're going to moderate this. this are you going to translate them for me, perhaps? Um,